יואל, אה, יואל אה, שקולניסקי from Tel Aviv University was kind enough to jump into the slot of Gabriel Waxman that couldn't come. And he will discuss about the advantages of the, and disadvantages of CRI-AM from the perspective of mathematician. So, Joel, please. So I would like to thank very much to the organizer for inviting me. And I think it is very brave of Nathan to ask a mathematician to talk to this audience, especially that early in the meeting. So I will do my best to make the math as accessible as possible. And what I would like to tell you is how mathematicians perceive the, the challenges and opportunities of this fascinating field of cryo-electron microscopy. Let me fix that. So, as you all know, the workhorse of structural biology for many, many years was crystallography. But the key feature of the method is that you need to have a crystal. Now, what if you cannot crystallize your sample? What if it is heterogeneous? Then you can use cryo-electromicroscopy. So uh, let me give you a quick overview of this method. So you want to resolve some structure. You take many copies of your uh, molecule. You put them in water, and then you pour them on this grid. Now, if we look at this grid, it is made of white cells where each uh, cell uh, has a net, usually a, a carbon film with uh, holes. And when we pour the water, we get a thin layer of water where the molecules are free to move. No? OK. And then we take this grid and we plunge it, we freeze it very rapidly. And we get an ice layer that freezes all molecules in place. And then we take the sample to an electron microscope and we start to collect data. So what we're actually doing, this is our ice layer with a randomly oriented molecule. We project it with an electron beam, and we simply uh, record the two-dimensional image at the bottom. Essentially, uh, we're counting electrons, what we'll get to that. And the output from the uh, electron microscope is a two-dimensional image containing several images of particles that we call micrographs. And the goal is to reconstruct the three-dimensional structure. And this entire process relies on very sophisticated algorithms. So you'll see pictures. This is a micrograph for illustration purposes. You usually see nothing. So I want to talk about this part in the process, the mathematical algorithms. OK, now, CryoM has been around since the 70s. But about six years ago, essentially overnight, it went, it made a giant leap forward. So this is the beta gal. So these are the structures you had prior to 2013. This is the structures you have today. And this is what today we call the resolution revolution. And there were two key ingredients to this revolution. So both of them are technological. Breakthrough. The first one is direct electron detectors. So the first time I met electron microscopy, uh, it was through Fred Sigworth at Yale. He was still using film, photographic film that you need to process. And then there was a short period where uh, experimentalists used CCD cameras, but that didn't work too well. And about six years ago, we got the direct electron detectors that essentially immediately greatly improved the quality of the data we have. So this is the first part of the uh, revolution. The second part was a tremendous increase in computing power. So for those of you who don't know, this is a GPU. Your kid is using that to play on his computer or her computer. This is what renders the graphics very fast. But turns out, it is also very good at calculations. So just each such card gives you like 10 teraflops, 10 to the number 13 floating point operations per second. You can easily fit four of those into a small laptop, and you get a really powerful machine. For comparison, if you take an advanced CPU, it wouldn't get to one teraflop. Now, to put you in perspective, this is the fastest supercomputer in the world 
not too long ago, that's 40 teraflops and takes 3.2 megawatts. And this is a PC you can buy for not too much money and plug in your home and you get the same computing power. And you can do much better than that. So we, our computing power really, really increased. So we can process more data, we can run heavier algorithms. Okay, so, but, okay, so we get data from the microscope. So what are we doing with this data? So let's see an overview of the computational workflow. So I told you that the, micro the, the microscope is uh, giving us micrographs. That is not correct. So uh, what is actually happen when we uh, image the sample, the sample moves during the imaging process. So if you will take just one shot, we will get something that is blurry, okay, like you see in the top. Fortunately, the detectors are fast enough to capture a burst of what we call movies or frames. And the first step in the processing pipeline is what we call motion correction, to take the different frames with the particles, try to align them, and generate what we call a micrograph, a single image that is sort of the aggregation of the frames. So just to give you a feeling of how much data we're talking about, it, here it could be up to 10 terabytes of movies few hundred megabytes to few terabytes of micrographs. Okay, so the next step is sort of preliminary pre-processing that we call CTF estimation. The point is that each image captured by the microscope is affected by a different filter that depends on the defocus distance. Essentially, each image is distorted differently. Now, we need the different distortions in order to recover the original molecule. Because in each image, we are missing some of the details. So the next step is what we call CTF estimation, just estimate the distortion in each image, and just so you can get the feeling. So here is one simulated image or particle at uh, three different defocus distances. So you see the image looks different. Okay, so once we have the micrographs, the next step is particle picking. We need some algorithm that in some unbiased way, we'll put boxes around our particles so we can extract them. So this step is called particle picking. And then we get a stack of 100,000 plus particles of size something between 100 by 100 to 1,000 by 1,000. I called it 500 by 500, but this is not a buggy PowerPoint. These are real images. This is how they look like. Okay, so they are really, really uh, noisy. The problem is that they typically contain a lot of junk. I mean, they are simply non-particles, contamination, all various of problems. So the next thing is what we call particle sorting. And the main approach today to particle sorting is what we call 2D classification. Essentially, we take our entire data set of images and we try to partition it into, say, a few hundred clusters that, such that each cluster is homogeneous, and hopefully the images that won't fit into the clusters are junk. Okay, so we start this to the classification and we get something like that. You see, some images look, make sense, some of them clearly junk, so we discard the junk and we repeat that and after enough iterations, hopefully we will get a clean data set. And I must say that this step of the pre-processing, I find it the most time consuming and where a real improvement can be made. Okay, and you can also uh, do 3D classification, but that requires some reference model that you don't necessarily have, so I won't talk about it uh, right now. Okay, so. Once we have a clean set of particles, the next step is to get a low resolution model of our molecule. Now, all existing high resolution refinement packages require an initial model, even though the packages that say they don't. 
Internally, they have to generate something, and you'll see in a second why. And here, well, you can use some prior knowledge. If it's similar to another molecule, you can try to pick at random something. That also sometimes works. But here, there is really a lot of beautiful math that we can do to generate a reliable initial model. OK, because we'll see in a second why. OK, and after we have a low resolution model, we go to one of the uh, high resolution refinement packages, and we combine the initial model with the original data to a high resolution model. And in the past couple of years, two steps were added. Then we go back to the raw data. We use our high resolution model to better estimate the uh, CTF, the transfer function of the microscope per particle. This is called CTF refinement or Bayesian polishing, depends where, which package you are using. And then we refine again, and hopefully we have some impressive number that we call resolution, hopefully. OK, so to talk about the mathematical challenges and opportunities of this method, we need to understand what we are imaging. So uh, let me try to explain to you the mathematical model. So here is our ice layer with randomly oriented molecules. And let's call uh, each molecule phi, some function. So each molecule in the ice layer is simply phi rotated by some unknown rotation that we call R. We don't know R, but a rotated molecule is phi rotated by R. And then we project it with an electron beam, and we get images. So the image formation model of each image is simply the line integral in the z direction of the rotated molecule. OK, so for those of you who don't feel very comfortable with integral, think of it that each pixel in the ith image, you take the rotated molecule, and you uh, just measure how much molecule the electron went through. OK, the width. That, that's good enough for our purpose. Obviously, in practice, it is much more complicated. So, so what we would like to do is to take the images and to estimate phi, given only the images, no other priors. And this is our inverse problem. In practice, uh, reality is much more complicated because the images are shifted. They are affected by a transfer function. We have really a lot of noise. But for our purpose, this model is good enough, just to explain the, the, the ideas. OK, so how do existing high-resolution refinement packages work? So given the images, you just say, OK, my molecule phi and unknown parameters, just rotation in this case, are the unknown model parameters. And then what you do, you pick some cost function that measures how much your model, phi and r, deviate from the images. So here I pick the simplest one. This is not the one used in packages, but this is the easiest one to explain. We simply simulate using my phi and rotation an image, check how, how does it fit the given image, and then we try to minimize over the volume and rotations. And the two common minimization algorithms used are uh, rely on uses expectation maximization, the EM algorithm. CryoSpark uses stochastic gradient descent. OK, but so this is, I mean, this is a classical approach in mathematics and optimization, and it has some serious drawbacks. First, it is a huge nonlinear, non-convex optimization. So before uh, we had GPUs, high-resolution refinement could take weeks. OK? But still, OK, so but now we have fast, fast computer. But still, we have very weak mathematical guarantees about the outcome of the process. And that is a, a polite way to say there is nothing that guarantees that it will converge to the right solution. And even if you want, if for the methods to converge to the right solution, we must have very good uh, initial estimates for phi and the rotations. So, 
So if we can somehow get an accurate initial low resolution model for phi, those methods uh, will work great. If not, there are no guarantees. Okay, so when mathematicians approach such a problem, usually they try to ask the simplest question possible. So the simplest one is, suppose they get clean images, no noise. Is there enough information to get back the molecule? No shifts, no noise, nothing. Just the model we've shown, that one. And for that, we use a very useful tool in analysis in this field, which is called the Fourier slice theorem, which says that the two-dimensional Fourier transform of an image is a slice through the 3D Fourier transform of the molecule. And for those of you who don't know Fourier transform, doesn't matter. Each image is a slice through the molecule. This is false, but good enough to get the intuition. Okay, so, uh, so now we have the following. So any image is a slice through the molecule. Any two planes should meet at a line. So any two images must have a common line. Okay, this is the common line property in cryo -EM. Okay, and now uh, we can do the following algorithm. Take your image stack, take the first image. Okay, you can always assume it's on the table in the XY plane because you can rotate your molecule that way. You take the second image, you find the common line with the first image. Okay, that's not enough because it can still move. You take a third image, you find common lines with the first two images, and now everything is fixed. You cannot move the three images. Okay, we have established a coordinate system. Then you take the remaining images in the stack, put them in place using common lines with the first three images, and you have populated phi. You got phi back. So uh, this is called the angular reconstitution that was developed by uh, two different uh, groups. And it tells you that at least if you have sufficiently many images and if you don't have noise, the images contain enough information to recover quite easily the molecule. So for example, we don't have the face problem, which is an inherent ambiguity. Okay, but I mean, this, is, this is in principle because the images are noisy and the method I just explained requires accurate detection of common lines. Okay, and if you mess up the first three images, we are reconstructing garbage. Okay, but at least we know the model and we uh, know that there is enough information. So now let me tell you what I think the first, uh, the three uh, main challenges of the field, at least from a mathematical uh, point of view. So the first one is obviously noise. The images are terribly noisy to the point that almost all algorithms we know from classical image and signal processing are useless. So we need to come up with uh, new things. And, and some problem we would like to solve is say, how, how to pick particles where uh, images are that noisy. How to get rid of junk. How to extract, extract information uh, from the images. Now, we know that I mean, there is always some detection limit. I mean, can we, is there a detection limit? Can we go around the detection limit? So by the way, in some cases, yes, but I won't have time to talk about it. Or even a simple question, what's the quality of my data? Should I stop the microscope? I mean, if I'm paying for that, if not. Okay, so the first challenge is noise. The second challenge is heterogeneity. So I told you that you take many copies of your molecule in water and you do something, but what if you cannot purify the sample? What if you have K different molecules and more often you are interested in the different conformations? of your molecule. So how to separate them? And this is a unique feature of cryo -EM compared to crystallography as it allows you to resolve heterogeneity, hopefully. Okay, so how does it change the model? So in the homogeneous setting, each image was a projection and a fixed molecule and the RIs were the unknowns. And we saw that if I have enough images, I should be able to recover phi. In the heterogeneous case, I have k different molecule, and each image is generated by projecting one of the molecules, and I don't know which one. So I don't know, not the rotations, 
and not which uh, molecule is it. This model has a clean mathematical solution. We don't really know a clean mathematical solution to this one. But due to a resolution revolution, we might be able to do something much more exciting as uh, some preliminary mathematical and I suggest that we might, might be able to solve continuous heterogeneity. So we don't have algorithms yet, but at least for the mathematical point of view, it seems that the, there is enough data to resolve continuous heterogeneity. So I find it a very exciting uh, challenge. So the third one would seem simple, uh, but I think it's not, and it's validation. So we took a stack of images, we did some magic, and we got a molecule. <laughs> and the single question is, is it correct? <laughs> so we know for sure that if we are not careful, we can way, be way off. <laughs> now, hopefully, I hope, those things cannot happen today due to safeguards implemented in the various packages, but I cannot guarantee that. But maybe uh, correct is not the right question because I mean, what is the ground truth? What we would like to do is how similar is our reconstruction to some ground truth, but then we run into what is similar and what is resolution, which for those of you who follow the mailing list, I am not going to touch. <laughs> okay, but something that when you fit the model, you must know is what can you expect to resolve? You get some density, and now you fit in something. Does it make sense? So uh, unfortunately, we don't really have good answers to this, but that, that makes it a good mathematical challenge. OK, but remember, the, the key is that we need algorithms that take only our reconstruction. We don't know the ground truth. So we just need to algorithm that takes the reconstruction and tells us something. OK, so now we know the experimental process. We know the computational process. We know the challenges. Now I would like to show you how math can help with uh, one of the challenges. And here we will see some more math, but I will try to be gentle. OK, so we see that this is the imaging model. And we have the Fourier slice theorem that tells us that each image is a slice through the molecule. Which slice I don't know, it's a slice. OK, and then we see the angular reconstitution, which says take the first, the first image, find the common line of the second image of the first one, the third one will fix the coordinate system, and just populate everything. Uh, and as I said, that is not going to work because we need to, require, to accurately detect common lines, which is difficult uh, when we have noise. And also the, the entire process is sequential, meaning if we messed up the three ones, we're done. Okay, so just to give you a feeling of is it possible, so here is a clean image I simulated and I just added white Gaussian additive noise, the simplest noise model, no shifts, nothing. And then I try to find the common lines between pairs of images. And you see that if the noise is not too bad, or we're good. 97% of the common lines we find correctly, 98%. But that deteriorates very quickly. And if we are looking at, say, 1 over 16, which doesn't, is not considered a lot of noise, we only detect like 0.6 of the common lines correctly, which means that our probability of finding common lines within three images is one in five. So we take a triplet, one in five, well, we got junk. So angular reconstitution is not working when we have noise. So let's see how can you use math to get rid of some of the noise. Okay, so fortunately, in the cryo-EM, we really have a lot of data. Okay, so each image is obtained by projecting a molecule from some direction. So there must be images in which we see the same view of the molecule, maybe from dif a different in-plane rotation. So what we will try to do is to find for each image its most similar images, somehow align, average, hopefully get rid of noise. 
Okay, so we can go like that. Take any two images, I and J, and try to align them. Okay, there is some rotation O that best aligns them. Then there is some difference we call DIJ, and we record the angle that gave us the best alignment. Okay, and now we can just uh, take DIJ, and for each I find the smallest J. That is not going to work because the distances themselves are very, very noisy. So it turns out we can do the following weird thing. If we have any images, build an n by n matrix H where the ij entry is simply e to the i theta ij whenever the distance is small and zero otherwise. Okay? And then some technicality, divide each a row by the number of non-zeros, and next is the heaviest math I ask you to know. Compute the three top eigenvectors of this normalized matrix. Okay, for those of you who don't know what is an eigenvector, it's a vector that is not changed by the matrix, or it's a command in MATLAB that you call eig. Okay, so now to each image, we attach a new vector, three complex numbers we call psi. The first eigenvector at the ith coordinate, the second eigenvector at the ith coordinate, and the third eigenvector at the ith coordinate. But why? Okay, so here is our model again. And if you write the unknown rotation matrix using columns, you have to believe me that the last column is the viewing direction of the molecule. Okay, I'm not going to prove it. But you have to believe me for that. And then we have the following theorem. The angle between the viewing direction of the images is given by this formula. Okay, now note, what we've done here, we computed the angles between the viewing directions of the images using just the images. All the information we had is two-dimensional, but still we can put our hands on the angle between the viewing directions of the molecules. Okay, so now we can just use this thing as a similarity measure. Find for each image i its k nearest neighbors using this g. Align and average. Okay, that, that's the basic uh, concept. So for, this, for these images, here is the outcome that we get. Okay, now uh, for those of you who... So what we have is a, a robust way of finding neighbors and denoising. It is reference-free. I just used the images, okay? And for those of you who work with data, know that this is completely different from 2D classification. I'm not forcing the data to have 100 classes. Each image is turned into a class by averaging it with its uh, neighbors, okay? And now we can use it for a uh, ab initio modeling. So let me tell you how we can fix the angular reconstitution to work on the uh, real data. Okay, so we said that the ang classical angular constitution takes three images. Let's call them i, j, and k, find the common lines between them, and stack all the others into the same coordinate system. But let's look again at the th first three images. So what we did here, we take image i, found the common lines with uh, image j, common lines with image k, and now everything is fixed. So if you uh, draw the picture and think it geometrically, once we fixed everything, we actually fix the relative uh, rotation between image i and image j. So, and if you do the math, you see that from these triple of, of images, I can get an estimate for the matrix R transpose Rj, which takes me from image i to image j. But there is nothing special about images i, j, and k. I can do it for all triplets of images. And then just build a matrix that has R transpose Rj as the ij element. And if I just factor at the matrix, I get all rotations at once. OK, so what we have actually done is a robust angular reconstitution. We look at all triplets of images from each triplet. We estimate some matrix. We build the matrix that aggregates all the data we have collected, and then by one shot, we get all rotations of all images. And here is an example uh, of a real uh, data set 
for which I generated an ab initio model. OK, so one thing we did good is that there is no longer a sequential process. We estimate all rotations at once. It is completely reference free. There was no model, just images. And it can be uh, proven mathematically that you are guaranteed to find the correct rotations. Or the algorithm breaks altogether. I mean, the, 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 there are no miracles. I mean, data is too noisy. You are not supposed to succeed. But fortunately, the algorithm comes with the built-in validation measures that are based on random matrix theory. Because what we do, we decompose a matrix or a matrix plus noise. And we know very well how those matrices behave, so we can uh, code built-in uh, validation measures like we wanted. OK, now, now you can ask, OK, so that's a fancy math. But we have our packages. Does it make any difference in practice? So um, at least I think it is. And I think this is the reason I'm here. Because a few months ago, a few months ago uh, actually, Ido, sitting at the back, which is a PhD student of uh, Nathan came to my office and said, uh, here, we have the three data sets and we tried all the tricks we know and it doesn't work. Can you please help? Uh, so fortunately, the algorithms work on those data sets and we were able to eventually get them to very high resolution. So to process the, uh, these data sets, there were three uh, tools that we used that are not in the conventional pipeline you're probably using. So the first one is a, a new particle picking algorithm. So uh, when I heard that to process data, you need to manually pick like 10,000 particles, I was horrified. Mathematicians don't do this stuff. So we <laughs> developed a new algorithm. And its nice thing is that it is, there are no parameters whatsoever. Just give the box size, and that's it, and wait. So in these data sets, we, uh, I used my uh, own particle picker. If you want to try it, you are invited. Then uh, we use the denoising I just showed you and the ab initio modeling. And then we went to the standard pipeline. So at least for these data sets, it worked. OK, so but for the last part of the talk, um, I want to show you something that I think is very interesting for the future. So all algorithms I show you so far are sort of aggregation algorithms. We take many images, and we get a class average. We take many algorithms, we get some model. And what we are discarding is the really unique feature of cryo -EM of single particle, that each image is special. And let me uh, do it slowly. So this is a classical imaging model, right? And suppose. We have a fixed molecule, phi. So during a single experiment, phi does not change on the right-hand side. The only thing that changes from each to image are the rotations, right? So this means that an electron microscope is a very expensive machine to compute a function g that takes rotation and returns image. OK? So Essentially, it's a function from what we call SO3, the set of rotations, the group of rotations, to images, say, 100 by 100. But each rotation depends only on three power parameters. The, the image can be 1,000 by 1,000, but the process is controlled by three parameters. So this means that G takes us from a three-dimensional space, low-dimensional space, to images of 100 by 100 pixels. OK, obviously, we don't know G. But the, the geometrical fact is that all clean images generated by a microscope must lie on a manifold of dimension 3. If we're able to see three-dimensional surfaces, all images would lie on a surface of dimension 3. And this is what I try to show here. Imagine a three-dimensional sphere. You pick an image, a point on the sphere. There is an image corresponding to that point. And the question is how to take advantage of this extremely strong geometric prior. Now, there are various things we can do. I would like to show you how we do denoising. So here is a crash course on denoising. There is a clean signal, x. But we don't observe it. We observe a noisy signal, y. Okay? And the problem is to estimate x, given y. 
So the most basic algorithm, not the best one, but the simplest one to explain is you take your data, why? You expand it in some good basis, say Fourier basis. And then you just discard some of the coefficients. Actually, you don't discard them, you shrink them, that's better, but let's call it you truncate. And if you do that, you see you get some denoising. This is not a very good denoising, but it is good for explanation purposes. We can do better. Okay, now the question is, uh, can we adapt the same trick to our data? So here's what we would like to do. We would like, given noisy images, and we know that they, are, they must lie on some manifold surface, we would like to compute a good basis on the manifold to take advantage to the structure, to the specific data set we have, and adapt it to the geometric structure that we know. And we know the mathematical answer for that. Those are the eigenfunctions of the Laplacian on the manifold. So there are some magic functions, Psi, that I will show you in a minute how to compute, that are good basis for images on the manifold. Then we will just expand each image in our magic basis, and we'll truncate. OK, and what we have done here is single particle denoising. We did not average any image one with another. We just expanded all images in the data set, and we denoised each image separately. So we are trying to extract information for each image separately. OK? And we are only using the given images. There was no model, no initial rotations, nothing. OK, so let me show you how we compute those magic functions. Psi, and turns out this is embarrassingly simple. So this is what you do. You take the images, and you build an n by n matrix W simply. You look at the difference between two images, take the difference square, divide by some small parameter that we know how to compute explicitly. Then you divide each row in the matrix W by its sum, just to normalize. And then you look at the eigenvectors of the resulting matrix A. This is our magic basis. And the, the result of theories to that, but this is the magic basis. OK? So we constructed A using just the given images. And actually, I don't have uh, the means to show it, but we can do much better. We can construct this basis using not only the given rotation, the given uh, images, but using all images and all their infinitely many in-plane rotations. So in some sense, we can augment the data set to infinity to get more data to fight the noise. And uh, fortunately, there are also fast algorithms to implement all the steps required to the algorithm. OK, and th that was a bit of heavier math. So let me try to convince you that it works. So here are uh, raw images from the Empire uh, 10081 data set. And I applied the algorithm I just showed you to this data set. And these are the denoised images you get. OK, now uh, biologists always wait. Is it the same rotation? Yes, you can look later. I mean, each raw image was denoised to one image. OK, so th th there is no class averaging here, nothing. The number of denoised images is like the size of the uh, raw images. and now. These images are clean enough to get an initial model. And this is what I did. I took a few thousand of these images and generated an initial model from the raw images without any class averaging. And this is the initial model and, and well, to reasonable resolution. I mean, 14 angstrom, it's enough for a, an initial model. And here is an example of another data set. That's the ATS. So these are the raw images, and these are a, images denoised using single particle denoising. And this is the ab initio model we get. And I would like to thank you for listening. <laughs>Okay, we, we are short of time, and uh, I, I'm sure that this will give us fantastic field to discuss after Richard's uh, plenary lecture uh, tomorrow, I think. Uh, but, but if you have some questions, 
I'm sure you'll say. Yeah. Uh, wait. So in the um, example that you gave about photosystem one, mm -hmm. um, you said that um, it couldn't be giving you a 3D model using any of the other programs. So, so my question is, what was it about the conventional approach that failed on such a big and, in principle, it should be straightforward uh, structure for determining what failed on the other methods that allowed your approach to work? So actually, I think Ido is better at answering what failed, I can, so... <laughs> The, 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 the main thing that failed, that, that uh, we, of course, uh, abusing the system biochemically because we don't use as pure material as we use for the X-ray crystallography. So the first things that we solved by X-ray, by uh, cryo-EM, were those that crystallized, and it was a piece of cake, no problem. In general, the so, problem is that you have... So to, then uh, we, 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 we went to, to more of this, and we failed because of the, the noise and the different other particles that were present there. And so, so I think the problem is that you have many parameters to pick on the way, and the various steps have no guarantees. So if you don't come up with a good initial model, there is nothing that guarantees that any of the iteration would converge. Or if you start a 3D classification, hopefully uh, to get rid of uh, junk, that, I mean, it converges to some local minimum, hopefully the one you want, but not necessarily. Was it biochemical impurity then? Ah, so... What, what we solved? Yes. No, no that, that's for us it is easy because we have chlorophyll and we have P700 there, so we know that it is 90% pure, but uh, yes. So that, I'm... That, <laughs> I'm a suspicious mathematician, so I gave him the structure. How do you know it's correct? So he told me, at the core, I know the crystal structure, and it fits perfectly. And it exists there for three and a half billion years, so yeah, it has it. to be correct. But not always you have the crystal structure.